Frank, I remember after 9-11, counterterrorism experts saying that it's a needle in a haystack. You're looking amid this climate of animosity for the one uh, potential terror act, terror plot that, that is closest to coming to fruition. And I wonder what, what is the parallel here when the rhetoric and the destabilized individuals are literally almost half the population is taking in the disinformation and it, it is coming at such a clip. And so you have to find among one of the two major political parties in America, the individuals consuming it, it's in the millions, but you have to find the ones that may act on it who have been radicalized. How do you, how do you begin to do that? So there's two issues here to, uh, to getting toward a, a solution. First, of course, is getting much, much better at the vacuuming up of intelligence and making sense out of it. And yes, it is incredibly difficult. Millions and millions of messages a day, posts, communications, blogs, websites, tweets, all out there trying and, and law enforcement desperately trying to discern aspirational from someone who's going to execute on, on their aspirations very difficult, and then layer in all the con valid concerns about civil liberties and privacy and needing to get a search warrant to identify somebody that Facebook or somebody else has tipped off to you. So the intelligence side's difficult, challenging, need to work on it. But I have to tell you, there's another side to this, which is while all of that's going on, and yes, the lone offender threat is incredibly challenging to defend about, to defend, you've got to at least do the easy stuff, make the most obvious targets harder. And Nicole, I have to tell you, as I talk to more and more senior law, law enforcement officials in Washington about the Pelosi attack, they are absolutely livid at the Capitol Police over this. In other wow. words, those who specialize for a living in executive protection are saying they have been they have been trained, the executive protection details at Capitol Police. They know how to hold the house. That's the term used within Secret Service, for example. You hold the highest protectee's house because, of course, that becomes the soft target when they're not there. Of course, you monitor the cameras live of the Speaker of the House, the person second in line to the presidency. Of course, you do that. So what they're calling for, people who talk to me are saying there's got to be accountability. As Luke uh, alluded to, something is wrong here. The, the Capitol Police were on notice at the congressional baseball game when Steve Scalise got shot. They were on notice with when Gabby Giffords, congresswoman from Arizona, got shot at a supermarket. It's not fixed. It's not fixed. And there does need to be accountability. Now, let's remember, the Capitol Police work for Congress. Um, that's their boss. So there's got to be accountability there. And whether it's because certain members of Congress, you know, I, I've seen this even in, in my own corporate security work, consulting, High-level people often don't like the kind of security you're telling them to do. Activate that alarm every time. Activate the motion set sensor whenever you're, you're going out or coming in. Um, you're going to have a detail with you when you stop at the local pizza place for a slice. They don't like it, but that's too bad because you, we are protecting democracy by protecting our elected officials. Um, Miles, there's also no way of suggesting that the targeting of Pelosi was unknown to anybody. I mean, there's some great new reporting from, from my colleagues about Stuart Rhodes, who wrote a message to Trump after January 6th, calling on him to save the republic. Prosecutors on Wednesday played some recordings of Rhodes that Alpers captured, including audio of the Oath Keepers founder talking about civil war in the wake of the January 6th attack. Quote, we should have brought rifles. We could have fixed it right then and there. I'd hang effing Pelosi from the lamppost, Rhodes said. So publicly and privately, the targeting of Nancy Pelosi with the most heinous kind of murder has been talked about by Trump's closest allies and participants in the January 6th insurrection. Yeah, Nicole, I mean, to continue off of Frank's point, there's a good guy side of this equation and a bad guy side of this equation. And on the good guy side, clearly the good guys need to protect themselves better. And the Capitol Police and the U.S. Congress needs to think very seriously how to increase protection. But let's look at the bad guy side of the equation. We are seeing a surge in terror threats against public servants, unlike anything we've seen in the modern era. I'm willing to submit that the terrorist threat to public servants is greater now than it was in the immediate post 9-11 period, just in terms of volume. We've seen a tenfold increase to threats to U.S. members of Congress since the early years of the Trump administration. That's a massive spike, but it's not just at the federal level, which tells you that this is a nationwide problem because one in five 
local officials say they feel threatened on the job. And not too long ago, we saw a poll that showed one in three election workers felt unsafe in their role. And in fact, I, Nicole, you know, you know that I talk to candidates all the time that are out there this cycle. There are candidates for public office out there wearing Kevlar vests, wearing bulletproof vests on the campaign trail and trying to disguise under, under loose fitting clothing because they are worried about being attacked. This is extremely serious, and we all know what's driving it. You noted at the top end of the program, it's conspiracy theories, just like we've seen drive other terrorist movements. Uh, in fact, one group of academics showed that the political stress index right now in the United States is at the highest levels it's been since the Civil War. So doing the same thing over and over that we've been doing to try to fix this problem is not going to work. And I think regardless of the results after the midterms, we're going to have to look long and hard not just at public safety reforms to protect members of Congress, but also at major democracy reforms, things like ranked choice voting and open primaries, to try to get more moderate and less extreme public figures elected so we don't have people fanning the flames of this violent rhetoric. Uh, I think we also have to, um, not that we don't do this here, all of us, but Ben Collins, I think, had a really powerful point at this hour yesterday when he said that the difference is that when Steve Scalise was shot, that violence was condemned by everyone across the ideological spectrum. Now, when Paul Pelosi is attacked brutally um, to the point where he needed, you know, skull surgery, you've got the leader of the Republican Party peddling the conspiracies about it. You've got Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about activists in the media covering it up. Um, I, I just want to play something that the, our friends at the Midas Group put together about all of the talk over the last four years about political violence out in the open from the most prominent figures on the right. Now, which Republican official or candidate has ever condoned or in any way encouraged any type of violent assault? Can you can you start naming them? I can't. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Knock the crap out of him. Maybe he should have been roughed up. They never name names because they can't. I want you to watch Nancy Pelosi again. It'll be hard not to hit her with it, but I will bang it down. It's a crime punishable by death is what treason is. Nancy Pelosi is guilty of treason, and we want her out. They never name names because they can't. That is a depiction of Representative Gosar carrying swords, attacking Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. They never name names. Let's have trial by combat. The day is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. We will not go quietly into the night. Strike your fear in the hearts of liberals everywhere, folks. Get on the phone, call your congressman. You can lightly threaten them. I'm coming after you. Madison Cawthorn's coming after you. Everybody's coming after you. I don't think liberals thought this whole mask thing through. You better believe I'm coming with my Springfield XPS. The swamp isn't truly drained until we've nailed the hides of the alligators to the wall. Laura Ingram is a lot of things. Stupid isn't one of them. Um, they do it out in the open. It is the hallmark of the modern Republican Party to do these things in public, to attack our democracy in public, to invoke threats of violence and celebrate acts of violence in public, to refuse to accept the results of democratic free and fair elections in public. Um, Luke, it is notable that Liz Cheney is endorsing more Democratic candidates, what, six days out from the election. But it's equally notable that Adam Kinzinger, her fellow Republican on the 1-6 committee, says we're not brave. We're just surrounded. We're in a sea of cowards. What is sort of the, the, the state of, um, you know, what, what is, what has it manifest itself up there that these two are the only Republicans out there backing candidates based on their commitment to democracy? Yeah, the, I mean, in an earlier era, an attack on the speaker's husband, where he was put in the ICU with a cracked skull, would have been a time for people to come together, maybe lower the rhetoric, express, you know, prayers and sympathies. In this era, what was what has been the response from the Republican leaders? You've either had people saying it's unfair to blame us for this and come out and defend 
what they've been saying about Nancy Pelosi and defending the rhetoric of the Republican Party, or much worse, either mocking it, laughing at the attack, as we've seen, or doubling down and increasing the conspiracy theories, the very things that would lead to such an attack, right? When you have President Trump, uh, you know, bringing out a, a, a new conspiracy theory to the public that there was a break in from the outside, from the inside out. Um, so it's exactly the opposite of the re responsible response, which would be to lower temperature to try to bring the country together. And it's a, a response that's saying what matters is that we can never be wrong. The other party is evil. The other party is the enemy. And we should stop at nothing to destroy them. And if that means violence, so be it. And sadly, that's the message that we've seen coming from a lot of the right, and especially some people, some of the highest ranking people on the right. Um, you know, I, I think I said yesterday, it's it's not funny. It's 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 not something for conspiracy theories, and it's deadly serious. And you know, I don't know where we're going as a country if if the leadership of the Republican Party won't condemn won't condemn violence and will embrace it.